Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to Women's AM. This morning we are joined by Sister Liz, Sister Nazia and our sister Zara Faris to continue our discussion on feminism and Islam. We are a live show so do please call the studio to put your comments or questions to the panel. The number is on your screens now or you can tweet us at Islam channel hashtag Ram15. So, Sister, just to continue the discussion, as, um, Sister Nazia, you were about to make another point. Yeah, I just want just to distress the, the difference here, that the fact that if we look 1,400 years ago um, for Muslim women, imagine the scenario where a daughter has now been given, it's established that she has the right to inherit. Yeah, this is something so, you know, you wouldn't think, why should this be a problem that a, a, a woman should inherit? Yet, if you look today, there are sections of society where they're not able to inherit. So if you look, in um, 2013, we saw for the first time, uh, first time the succession bill being put into place where if Kate and William had had a daughter, um, she would now be considered an heir. So, and we also know within certain sections, uh, sections of society, like for example, with, amongst the aristocrats, they have, um, they still practice male uh, primogeniture, I think that's what it's called, where if they don't have sons, then the inheritance has to go to the next ma male in line and not the direct, uh, not to daughters. And it could be someone who's a uh, far distance of a relative. So you can see the difference. Our legislations are there. Theirs is still work in progress. They're still trying to reclaim rights. See, that's quite surprising. Rights. When yeah. we initially um, discussed this earlier in the boardroom, you mentioned um, the whole um, law amongst the aristocrats. This wasn't being, we, we weren't quite that aware of that laws like that existed still here. They, I mean, yeah, there are certain laws like this. There is something else, though, that I really want to bring out today, and that's the fact that we have a tendency often to misdiagnose the cause of some of the things that we see in the world today. So we say um, women are experiencing certain hardships, and so we might point, for example, to the Muslim world and say, look at the state of Muslim women there. They are um, oppressed, and all the, the, pop, the popular terms which come out of, of that discussion. But the reality is that it's a very uh, narrow way of looking at the situation. Yes, there is problems, but the diagnosis of saying it's just men oppressing women isn't really accurate. So, for example, if we look at how the Arab Spring started, it was uh, Mohammed Bouaziz who was so frustrated because he couldn't work to provide for his family because of corruption, etc., etc. Now, he didn't want to earn money so he could go off and discover himself on an eat, pray, love mission. He simply wanted to be able to provide for, you know, his family, presumably his wife and maybe yeah. including daughters if he had any. And so nobody said at that time, oh, that men are oppressed, but rather it's still the only narrative that we hear is that the women are oppressed. And I think that this uh, very short-sighted analysis of the situation is what unfortunately leads some people to think that they need therefore gender-centric uh, solutions yeah. or a solution that focuses only on the women or only from a female perspective. A lot of the problems are not due to gender, I would say, but due to anarchy and due to um, general uh, uh, confusion in society about how things should be done and a lack of uh, implementation of justice yes. uh, in of itself. But this issue with this term feminism is being taken up by quite a, f a lot of Muslim women at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. um, but are we getting to, I mean, what's wrong with it? Are we getting a bit too bogged down by terminologies? If, if people, sometimes if people do it with the intention that, okay, we're, we're being active women, we're calling for women's rights and women's justice. So we're taking this term just to, you know, show that. Are we getting... Uh, I would say that there is a, very quickly, I would say that there is a spectrum of how this term is used and there are those who use it in a very ideological way and meaning it in its most you know radical sense possible with you know all bells and whistles um, and then it kind of you know it grades and, and tapers off into a state where it's simply just a woman who may who may see um, uh, injustice or see or even a man who sees some injustice done against women and says well I'm gonna fight for this yeah. maybe this is feminism and I should call myself a feminist so sometimes it's used um, in, in, in an innocent way mm. however the problem with that is that it brings a lot of baggage with it and you inadvertently leave the door ajar for all these other types of feminism to, to come following behind. Sister Liz, you look like you really want to yeah, jump in there. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think I was just going to make the point that we are seeing this a lot more in our community. You're hearing a lot more Muslim women talk about feminism and, you know, say, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a Muslim woman and I'm a feminist. Um, and I, I was try to kind of analyze why that is and why we see more of this um, and for me I think it, it came into sort of two um, kind of major reasons the firstly uh, the first reason being that 
you know, we look at the Muslim world, as you say, we're seeing a lot of oppression and it's a quick fix answer. Oh, you know, this is oppression against women, it's all men's fault, you know, this is this is why we're going to become feminists because we were so, so strongly opposed to this. And then on the other hand, we have a movement away from Islam and the knowledge of Islam and the fact that it kind of gives you all the answers. You know, are, they, are there a problem with the way women are perceived or the way women are being treated? Yes, there are actually in lots of societies. Um, what does Islam say about that? How does Islam rectify that? How does Islam guide our uh, our behaviours and our, our um, you know, our inclinations into a way that's away from that? And I think this is where we're maybe letting ourselves down, maybe letting our kind of younger sisters down in that we're not being vocal enough about the fact that actually yes Islam does offer a solution and we're not living things the best way they are at the moment but we could be. Nazir, if it's sisters saying that they're reclaiming their rights mm -hmm. by calling themselves feminists, what is wrong with that? Um, <laughs> Especially I mean just because it historically means something but if you are not intentionally taking it from that context why is that wrong? Do you know what the issue is? We've got to stop referring to other ideas and values as a way of solving our problems. Because it's like what Liz said, our answers are there. They're already there within Islam. And we have to understand that when we face problems and situations within our um, societies and communities, we need to go back to Quran and Sunnah. That's what needs to be done. And the problem is we've, we've fallen into this kind of whole thing of looking elsewhere for solutions, when actually the solution is there under our noses, but why are we not turning to it? Yeah. The fact that we have comprehensive um, uh, legislations and values and ideas, everything telling us how we not just as women but as as a society as everyone that is made up within that society how we function and how we relate to one another it's all there it's all present but everything has been kind of been torn apart and we're all going to other sources as a way of rectifying how to bring justice into our societies because actually that's what we're looking for we're looking for justice what other movements like specifically for feminism that I've noticed is more about privileges there's the whole issue of not understanding that actually it's the way that they view their relationships for us we clearly understand what a relationship between a man and a woman is we're e we are equal in the sense that um, that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are equal but the only way we are one more than the other is in the sense of the piety, the taqwa that we hold. But other than that, what our inherent differences in our nature is something that is recognized because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. He knows what he has created and he has defined roles which are therefore supposed to be complementary. They're supposed to, um, and it's necessary for them to be complementary for the, for the whole um, human race to survive. And what's happening is that people are creating this kind of uh, a benchmark where the man has been used as a as a reference point and in the whole process who a woman is and what she should be in her own rights that's not been addressed and therefore her her inherent nature is being ignored so this is such an important and broad topic and unfortunately we are running out of time so sister Zafra, so what advice would you give to sisters who are looking into fem feminism rather than Islam uh, I would say, and this is what I was going to say next anyway, which is that some people perceive it as, as you mentioned, the quick fix solution. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you look at the reality, it's far from a quick fix solution. Feminists, even today, Western feminists are saying they still haven't achieved what they wanted to achieve. There's no end yeah, in yeah. sight, really. Yeah. Whereas if you look at what Islam did within the space of such a short period of time, for example, yeah. completely reducing, almost eliminating, for example, female infanticide, something which is still widely practiced in India today. So don't see Islam as the slow solution. Islam mm. can be actually the quicker and most efficient and more just solution. Don't see Islam as a slow solution, quicker and more just <laughs> system. This still is. Uh, oh yeah. Again, I think you know, if you're calling yourself a feminist because you feel devalued in your society, you know, go, go back to the Quran. What does the Quran? What does Islam say about women? You know, Islam it doesn't differentiate between men and women, as Nazia says. And I remember actually listening to a talk uh, by a revert sister, and she said actually when she went to the Quran and she looked what the, looked at what the Quran said about women, far from being you know the oppressed, the the less than the man, the underneath the man, rather women are actually the kind of deluxe model of the human race. If you look at the way that our status is elevated um, and, and the way that, that, that we're, um, you know, we should be protected and we should be, uh, you know, our roles as mothers, as wives, you know, these are things that we shouldn't be ashamed of. These are things that should be, uh, you know, we, we, we should celebrate them more. Sister Nazia. 
Last words. I can't add to that other than just the fact that we, we do have problems within our society, but it's so important we really understand what the root of it is and always go back to Quran and Sunnah uh, mm. and have trust in that. We have to have trust in our values and in our traditions. Yeah. And I be think. proud of calling yourself a Muslim more than be proud of calling yeah. yourself a Muslim. I think that's the, the, the pressure to yeah. your mind. This to, is yeah. possibly the key that we be confident <laughs> in Islam yeah. and feel powerful, empowered by Islam, yeah. and that we don't, shouldn't feel the need to possibly turn to other things yeah. when Islam already gives us those yeah. solutions and answers. Well, alhamdulillah. It's been a great discussion. Jazakallah khair, sisters. I wish we were running out of time. We could continue forever with this discussion. Jazakallah khair. You know, the Muslim woman has sought liberation through the teachings of Islam and need not seek it elsewhere. Difference in genders does not mean a struggle between men and women, but rather a difference in roles and opportunities in order to exalt one another to do good and reach the goal in pleasing Allah. I leave you with a verse from the Quran. The believers, men and women, are awliya, helpers, supporters, friends, protectors of one another. They enjoin on the people the ma'roof, the Islamic monotheism, and all that Islam orders want to do, and forbid people from al-munkar, i.e. polytheism, and disbelief of all kinds, and all that Islam has forbidden. They perform as salah iqamat as salah and give the zakah, and obey Allah and his messenger. Allah will have his mercy on them. Surely Allah is almighty, all wise, from Surah Al-Tawbah. This really is a vital discussion for us to understand and continue to engage in as Muslim women, especially when it's our place in Islam that is used when Islam is attacked. Now, if you've missed any of it, all is not lost. You can watch the, catch the repeat tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. And of course, you can catch the highlights from this week on Sunday at 3 p.m. But before we head to the break, here's, here's we, we have another quick uh, competition for you. Yes, we love our viewers and love spoiling them. Take a look at this. Yes, we have a...